Bhagavad Lila, 10th Canto, Chapter 12, Agasura Mardin, the killing of the snake demon Agasura, who was sin personified. Before describing the killing of this great demon, Agasura, we wanted to describe something about the previous chapter, Chapter 11, Bakasura, the duck demon. Bhaktinot Thakur says that he represents cunningness, craft, hypocrisy, false behavior. Pure bhakti or shuddha bhakti cannot appear in one's heart as long as he's still subject to hypocrisy and crafty behavior. Bakasura represents the cheater, one who's a cheat, cheating himself, he accepts a bogus guru and worships him, though undeserving. Bhakasura represents the pers personification of cheating religion, and he represents Nama Parad. These are some of the ideas of Bhakti Thakur. Certainly there's a lot of ducky behavior in all of us, a lot of cunningness and hypocrisy and falsity. And Krishna can split that apart and remove it from our hearts. So now we'll read about the snake demon Agasura. One day, early in the morning, Krishna decided to go to the forest to enjoy a picnic, lunch, or rather breakfast. Blowing his buffalo horn, Krishna gathered all the coward boys and calves with a beautiful sound. Keeping the calves in front, Kanai and the gopas entered the forest. Each of Krishna's thousands of gopa friends had thousands of calves to tend to. The boys were beautiful and in a very playful mood. Each boy was equipped with a lunch bag, a lunch tiffin, a buffalo horn, a flute, and a stick for controlling the calves. Of course, because Krishna is unlimited, he had unlimited number of calves. Although their mother, respective mothers had already decorated them with jeweled ornaments, gold pearls, and gunjamala. When they went into the forest, they further decorated themselves with the natural opulences and beautiful ornaments provided by Vrindavan itself. The boys adorned themselves with colorful fruits, green leaves, bunches of flowers, peacock feathers, and painted various dots and designs on their forehead and arms with the, ver with the different colored mineral powders found in Vrindavan. One of the fun games that the coward boys would play is that one boy would steal another's lunch tiffin. And when a boy came to understand that his tiffin was stolen, the other boys would pass it around until it became further out of reach. When the owner of the lunch tiffin became upset, all the other boys would laugh at him. And when the proprietor of the bag would cry, then they would return his tiffin or lunch bag. And Vishnath explains very interesting these pastimes in his commentary, Sarata Darshani. He says, The coward boys used to steal each other's articles. One boy would steal another's food container take it to a distant place and hide it under a tree surrounded by thorn bushes and red ants. When the boy whose lunch bag was stolen tried to retrieve it, the other boys would throw it further away. And when he ran after it, they would throw it still further. The boy would cry, then the other boys would laugh and return his lunch bag. Sometimes Krishna would run off alone into the forest to enjoy the scenery. 
and the other boys would run after Krishna to be with him. And while running after Krishna, they would cry out, I will be the first to touch Krishna. No, I will. No, I will. While playing in the forest, all the boys would be differently engaged. Some played on their bugles and flutes. Some imitated the buzzing of bumblebees or the singing of cuckoos. Some would run after their shadows on the ground, while others imitated the posture and movements of the swans. Some would sit down quietly with the ducks, and some imitated the dancing of the peacocks. Some boys played with the monkeys by trying to attract their babies, by imitating them, by making faces at them, or by climbing up the trees. Says Mishnah says they would pull the tails of the baby monkeys. They would climb the trees by grabbing the tails of the monkeys hanging from the branches. After imitating the funny faces of the monkeys, the boys would jump from tree branch to tree branch. They leaped after the frogs into pools of water, which were created by the cascading waterfalls. Upon seeing their reflections on the water's surface, the boys would laugh heartily. Others would jump with the frogs. When they, raising their arms, the boys would shout loudly in a playful mood. And then they would curse their echoes, saying, Are! Aha! Who is that speaking? Hearing a, symbol, hearing a single syllable echo back, the boys would become angry. What is this? The echo would reply, vibrating, Re, 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 re. And the boys would reply by saying, Today you will die. And this they would cur this way the boys would curse again and again and never come to an end. In this way the boys played with Krishna after having accumulated the results of pious activities for many, many lives. How can one explain their good fortune? This is, of course, text 11. Sakam, Sakam, Vijaru, Krita Punya Punja. Krita Punya Punja. Although Krishna is made of complete bliss, Krishna experienced intense ecstasy playing with the Brijbasis in various pastimes of love. They too attain the pinnacle of joy in his association. Therefore, the bridge bhasis were more fortunate than all others, Krita Punya. Of course, this is a material viewpoint. For the Nitya Siddha bridge bhasis, Krishna's eternal associates, who far surpass the Gyanis and Dasya Bhaktas, the cause of playing with Krishna is not material piety or punya. In this verse 11, the word punya in the phrase krita punya punja can only mean activities pleasing to Krishna by which Krishna comes under the devotee's control. It does not mean material piety or heaps of good deeds, says Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. While Krishna was playing with the boys, a vast, terrible demon named Agasura came there sent by Kansa. He was a member of an illustrious family, which included his, his older brother, Bakasura, and his beautiful older sister, Putana. They were one family of ferocious demons. Even the demigods were afraid of Agasura, very eager to see him killed. When Agasura saw the Gopas enjoying, he could not tolerate it, and he thought, this Krishna has killed my brother and sister. So just to please my brother Bhagasura and Putana, <laughs> I will kill Krishna along with all his friends. Let me make an offering for the departed souls of my brother and sister. 
and then all the other inhabitants of Vrindavan will automatically perish as well. After making up his mind in this way, Agasura utilized his mystic city of Mahima, city, to assume the form of a huge, gigantic python who was three kilometers long. And when he opened his mouth, it appeared like a huge mountain cave. He lay down on the path, hoping to swallow all the boys. The lower lip of that demon Agasura rested on the surface of the earth, and his upper lip of his mouth touched the clouds. His tongue was like a broad highway. His breath was like hot wind, and his eyes blazed like red, fiery coals. At first, the gopas thought that the demon was a decorative statue. But then they could understand Dan, some of them, that it was a great python. And the boy said, Hey, suckers, is this a dead creature? Or is it a living python spreading its mouth just to swallow all of us? This is certainly a beast sitting here waiting to swallow us. Its upper lip resembles a cloud reddened by the sunshine and its lower lip resembles the reddish shadows of a cloud. The inside of this demon's mouth is very dark, like the cave of a mountain, and his teeth are like huge mountain peaks. The fiery hot wind is the breath coming from its mouth and giving off the bad smell of burning flesh because of all the dead bodies this demon has eaten. Has this creature come here to swallow us? If so, it will be killed like Bakasura without delay. Looking at the beautiful face of Sham, the boys laughed loudly, clapped their hands, and entered the python's mouth. They had full faith in Krishna, because they had solid experience of his saving grace from the mouth of Bakasura. Actually, the gopas wanted to enjoy the sport of entering the demon's mouth and being saved by their dear friend, Krishna. Krishna knew that the demon was Agasura, that it appeared there, while listening to the boys talk about it as if it was a statue, he wanted to forbid them from entering the demon's mouth. As Krishna was considering this, the coward boys nonchalantly entered Agasura's mouth along with all the calves. The demon swallowed all of them, but he remained immovable because he wanted Krishna to enter his mouth. When Krishna saw that all the gopas and calves, who did not know anyone but him as their Lord, had acted on their own and were now helplessly within the belly of the demon. Krishna became momentarily struck with wonder. And Krishna was unsure what to do. It was intolerable for Krishna to be separated from his gopa friends. But all this was the arrangement of Yoga Maya. Krishna wondered, what can be done? How can I simultaneously kill the demon and save all my friends within his mouth? Krishna entered Agasura's mouth. The demigods hiding behind the clouds exclaimed, Oh, what has happened? But demons like Kansu were jubilant. When Krishna heard the exclamation to the demigods, he suddenly expanded himself to gigantic proportions within the Agasura's mouth. And likewise, the demon expanded himself. However, his attempt to expand was useless and futile. Agasura was being suffocated and his breathing stopped and his eyes popped out of their sockets. And the demons 
life air burst out from the Brahma Randran, Randra atop his head. Krishna glanced over the dead calves and boys and brought them back to life. Mukunda exited the demon's mouth along with all his friends and calves. From out of the gigantic python's body, an effulgent spark of life illuminated all directions, waited in the sky for Krishna to emerge from the demon's mouth. As the demons looked on, that spiritual spark entered Krishna's body. Agasura had achieved liberation by being killed by Krishna. It appears that he attained Sayuja Mukti, merging into Krishna's effulgence, but actually he attained Sarupya. He attained the form of Lord Vishnu with four arms. This indicates that at the end, even just for a moment, Agasura thought of Krishna with devotion. The light which was visible was actually the light from Agasura's spiritual body which he attained at that moment. Because his body was spiritual, it could not be seen with material eyes. Agasura's entering Krishna's body was just a show as in the case of Shishupal and Dantavakra. Although Shishupal and Dantavakra attained Sarupya Mukti, as eternal associates of the Lord, the former Jai and Vijay, says Vishwanath, when they died, a light from their bodies entered the Lord. This is another opinion about the visibility of the light. Being greatly pleased, the demigod showered flowers up Sara's dance, Gandharva sang to the company of musical instruments. Brahmanas offered Vedic stutis to glorify Krishna. Brahma heard all the celebrations and immediately came down to take a look. Upon seeing so much glorification of Krishna, he became completely astonished. Krishna is God, so for him to appear as the human son of Nanda Yashoda is an act of his great mercy. Because even Agasura achieved Sarupya Mukti, then who can judge the extent of Krishna's mercy? If one can even once bring Krishna's form into his mind, he can attain salvation like Agasura. What can be said of those whose hearts the Lord enters when he appears as an incarnation? The dry skin of the snake Agasura stayed a long time in Vrindavan and became a wonderful cave in which the children used to sport and play. The incident of Krishna killing Agasura took place when the Lord was five years old, but it was disclosed to the Brijabhasis of Brajabhumi after one year, as if it had taken place on that very day. Parikshit asked, How is it that the killing of Agasura occurred during Krishna's Komara when he was five years old, and then during his Poganda age when Krishna turned six, it was described to the Brijbasis as if it had recently occurred. Because of remembering Krishna within the core of his heart, Shukadev momentarily lost all contact with his external senses. Then with great difficulty, he revived his powers of perception and began to reply to Maharaj Pariksit's question. This closing verse of the chapter describes, in chapter 12, describes the response of the speaker of the Bhagavatam, Shukadev Goswami, when he was asked by Prikshid Maharaj during the seven-day narration of the Bhagavat, Bhagavat Sapta, he says, he said, Guru, O oh Gurudev, Shukamuni, Please tell me how this happened, whether this was created by Yoga Maya or Mahamaya. When Shukadev Goswami heard this question, he immediately remembered Krishna within the core of his heart, and he externally lost contact with the actions of his senses. With great difficulty, Shukadev revived his external sensory perception 
and spoke to Maharaj Pariksit about Krishna Katha. Vishnath says that he regained, Shukadeva regained his external consciousness because of the loud chanting of the Lord's name by Narad, Vyasa, and other great rishis who were in attendance at that recital of the Bhagavatam being spoken by Shukadeva to Pariksit. The uh, conclusion of the, of the Anartha represented by Aga Sura. The word Aga means sin. The very word means sin. He was the personification of sin. Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains in Krishna Samhita that Aga Sura, the killing of Aga Sura, represents the removal of the sinful tendency of the mind to commit violence and harass others due to hatred and malice. This is an offense against the holy name. Jiva Hinsa. Agasura represents cruelty and intolerance, a lack of compassion for other living entities. Such a bad quality causes one's attachment to Krishna to diminish and wane. Tendencies that we may have psychic tendencies to be hateful or malicious towards someone or to be cruel or intolerant, then these are snake-like qualities that are represent, represented by Agasura. He wanted to harass all the coward boys out of his hatred for Krishna. And the killing of Aga, which means sin personified, represents the destruction of sin personified within our hearts. So this concludes chapter 12 of Bhagavad, Tam Kanto Bhagavatam. Grantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai 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 Shri Radhe Jai Jai Shri Radhe Jai Jai Shri Radhe